Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today for our session. Uh, we're going to cover how to build secure and observable uh, Kubernetes platforms for scaled software delivery. Uh, my name is uh, Mikhail Shapirov. Uh, I'm a partner solutions architect um, within AWS Partner Program. I specialize on containers and work with many, many different partners uh, in that area. Previously, I was a senior software developer engineer at AWS. And before that, I was a, a platform architect, an enterprise architect in different capacities. So the topic that we're going to be discussing is very uh, near and dear to me. Uh, together with me is my colleague, uh, Carmen Cuccio. It is a, a real pleasure to have him with us on this session. Uh, Carmen will cover architectural aspects uh, and uh, some business drivers for Kubernetes-based platform. And I'll focus more on some of the technical uh, nuances uh, later on. Uh, I'll let Carmen introduce himself. Uh, Carmen, please take it away. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, as Mikhail said, my name is Carmen Puccio. I'm a senior manager here at AWS. Uh, my team is responsible for both our partner uh, integrations with our container partners and also our serverless partners. Um, I've been with AWS for roughly about five years now. And prior to this role, I was principal partner solutions architect uh, within the container program, uh, working with our various different partners to drive integrations with our various different AWS container related services. Um, I was also part of the AWS mass migration team, uh, figuring out how to move customer workloads over at scale to AWS in a very in a very lift and shift mode. Um, today's talk is obviously about containers and observability and security. Um, so hopefully you find it interesting. And and with that said, let's let's get started. Okay, and, and to kick it off, I'm just going to at very high level, why are customers adopting containers in Kubernetes? Um, it, it shouldn't really be a surprise to you, but let's start with containers. Um, first and foremost, it's about the efficiency and the agility. Um, we, we talk to our customers all the time and we teach this to them that adopting containers is, is essentially forcing you to embrace automation. Uh, we know that automation increases speed and ease of testing when you're iterating on your applications. And, and essentially the goal here is you want to move to a point where you have controlled and repeatable processes and inside of your environment. You want to see your product delivery um, dramatically increase. You want to improve your, your stability. You want to improve your quality. You want to improve your security. And you want to focus on reducing that operational burden by removing heavy lifting wherever you can. And embracing automation allows customers to be able to reduce risk and focus on building business logic within your applications. And then as for Kubernetes and why customers are adopting it, it's really it's about the ecosystem. So again, it shouldn't be a surprise, but customers are choosing Kubernetes for the vibrant ecosystem and, and community. So whether it be open source APIs, broad flexibility, um, any one of those reasons, they rely on essentially Amazon. And, and moreover, they look to Amazon EKS to handle things such as the heavy lifting around security and operating Kubernetes at scale. And, and moreover, there's now this hybrid story and customers want consistency. They want to run their workloads in the cloud, in their data centers and at edge and leaving, you know, and they want to leverage those consistent set of APIs to be able to ease those operational burdens that I mentioned before. Um, if you haven't seen the announcements that we recently put out around EKSA and EKSD, um, we're enabling our customers now to run Kubernetes wherever they want. So when you start thinking about adopting Kubernetes and, and all the challenges around it, and I'm just going to build this slide out real quick, you, 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 you typically hear this question, and Mikhail and I hear this a lot, and it's essentially, where do I start? Right? And there's a wide variety of options, whether it be open source, cloud vendor, or ISB related tools that a customer has to think about inside of each one of these boxes. Um, from a security or a networking perspective, you know, which what, what does the customer pick when it comes to you know, choosing a CNI, for example? Do they pick the AWS VPC CNI? Should they go with something like Calico? From a management and government perspective, you know, if you start thinking about it, should you use something like Managed Prometheus and Grafana, or should you use it in a self hosted matter, right? All these decisions take time. And the question you need to ask yourself is, do your application teams actually need to think about these teams or should they focus on the applications themselves? And if you think about this in the context of leveraging EKS, um, you know, they, they do get some great benefits out of the box. Obviously, it automatically manages the availability and scalability of the Kubernetes control plane. Um, so again, like scheduling containers, managing, you know, the availability of your applications, storing data and, and key tasks are taken care of for you. But when it comes to the dimensions again, and I'll build this out, you have choices to make. 
right? So again, like maybe it's compute. Now you have to choose, do you want to run it on EC2? Do you want to leverage EKS Fargate? Do you want to leverage managed nodes, node groups? Maybe from the security perspective, you start thinking about IAM permissions. How are you going to manage secrets, for example? Um, you know, if you want to externalize those secrets to the cluster, how are you going to do something like that? Or if it's the runtime security model, what are you going to do in order to detect malicious activity inside your cluster? So there's a lot of things that you need to essentially account for. And if you think about it one step further, um, that's just at a single cluster in a single region for a single business unit. If you start thinking about our larger customers or our more sophisticated customers, you now have a different challenge and it's a much bigger one. So you, you now have to figure out these questions across your regions or you have to figure them out across your business units. And as you can see, this is essentially like a force multiplier where the problems of where and how do I start and how do I drive consistency across my business units while still giving these teams the, the ability to innovate and have the freedom that they need to get their applications out, it becomes a really tough problem. So, so I want to just really quick talk about, you know, essentially what it looks like from the onboarding perspective from an application uh, side of things. That was the infrastructure side of things that I was thinking about before. But, you know, think about it this way. You have your cluster configured and now you need to think about, I want to deploy my applications. And in the build phase that you see here, you know, you typically have a developer or a team and they're pushing things to some sort of repository, uh, whether it's GitHub or something along those lines. And then you have a CI pipeline that's going to kick off and do a variety of things. Maybe it's testing your code. Again, it should be looking for things like security vulnerabilities. And then what's going to happen is that the deploy phase is going to happen. And what typically happens is obviously the container image goes up to some sort of registry. Um, if the customer is leveraging GitOps as their operating model, which they should be, they, 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 they start thinking about like, okay, now we have to figure out how to have our GitHub or our GitOps config repo updated with the latest changes. Maybe you have something like Argo or Flux running to continuously monitor the applications that are comparing the current live state against the desired state um, that's specified in the GitHub repo. Um, and then lastly, from, from an operations perspective, you, you have, again, this, this choice that developers need to make they need to figure out how to handle things like metrics and logs and traces. What are you going to do to actually get all of that information out of your cluster and put it into a clean and concise format someplace downstream for folks to consume, right? So at the end of the day, you have to think about deploying workloads, but at the, at the same time, there's this complexity that your teams have to figure out. And in reality, the developers shouldn't have to think about those things. They should be able to just onboard and take advantage of the, the, the infrastructure in a pre-provisioned manner. So I want, I want to double, double down on essentially what does good look like from a modern software delivery perspective. Um, I'm not going to touch on all of these, but if you think about it, it's a pro-con model, right? But you know, if you look at it right at the top, it basically says develop, developers lack visibility into applications running in production, right? So again, like thinking about it this way, you want to have it where the applications are fully instrumented for metric and log collection. And to my point before, it's hard enough to get standardized logging in place inside of your organization organizations, let alone the consistency and where logs are going and how they are captured, right? And, and again, this really is, is where you want to be when you start thinking about what does good look like? So each one of these dimensions are essentially something that when your development teams come on board to a platform and they want to adopt essentially, you know, the, uh, the next generation system, these are the things that should just essentially come out of the box in a batteries included model which gets us into the topic of today's talk. It's, it's essentially the concept of a shared services platform. Um, you may be familiar with this topic, but I'll just do a quick flyby on it. Uh, so we define shared services platform as an internal development platform that allows multiple teams to run applications on shared infrastructure that is managed, secured, and governed by a central platform team. And when we start thinking about this, it, it's essentially broken up into two dimensions or two personas, right? So you, you, you think about it this way. Inside of an org, what are the responsibilities? Well, your platform engineers, they're here to essentially build and define the platform against the company's requirements. They then offer that platform as a service to the software engineers. And then obviously the software engineers or your developers are the consumers of the platform. And they only focus on building applications. They don't have to worry about anything that's under underlying or the underlying infrastructure within the system itself. And, and you, when you basically think about it this way, and it's broken up into, into two groupings here, on the left, you have DevOps, right? And again, not a new term, but 
we define it as essentially the combination of, you know, cultural philosophies, practices, and tools. And again, the goal is to increase an organization's ability to, do, to deliver applications and services at really high velocity. Um, we talk about the pizza model here at Amazon quite a bit, where essentially you're not siloing um, your, your groups out, everybody's working together in a single team, and they're working across the entire application lifecycle. When with the concept of platform ops, which you see on the right, you're essentially creating a dedicated team that maintains this self-service platform or this SSP for the application dev teams um, that, that includes everything needed to build an, an automated DevOps value stream. So again, developers don't have to worry about the infrastructure, the operational tooling, and they can focus on developing. So think about it essentially as a way for your dev teams to still have all of that flexibility to work in that pizza team model with certain with certain freedoms. But the platform ops team is there to ensure a level of consistency so you don't get out of control. This is a really high level overview of the components that would make up a shared services platform or an SSP based off of what we see with our customers. Obviously in each component, there's, there's a, a wide variety of tools to choose from. So whether again, it's AWS native, open source, partner ISV, it's, it's up to the platform team to figure out what tools they want to standardize on. And then from an application perspective as a developer, you think about this as a batteries included model. You, again, you're onboarding into the platform and you get the things that you see in the platform as a benefit. So again, my, my questions around you know, security and my questions around visibility is taken care of just by onboarding. And Mikhail's gonna show you how to actually put this in practice. Um, Real, real quick, I want to double down as well on the motivations for building the, the shared services platform. Um, when it comes to velocity, again, we want our developers to move fast. Um, you've probably seen, it, probably even me, talk about the innovation flywheel, but it's a very common thing that we talk about here at AWS, where we want to see our customers essentially learn from failing fast. So basically, try, learn from your mistakes, capture that data, try again, get to a point where you're iterating. And we, that, again, that's our innovation flywheel. And the next motivator is essentially you know, a governance model. So security and, co and compliance are uh, an utmost concern for all of our customers. And, and again, like security should be taken very, very seriously. And we have a culture here at AWS where we say it's job zero, meaning doesn't matter what the other priorities are, security is your number one priority. And companies that want a platform that complies with their security platforms, uh, you want the applications that are part of the platform to just simply inherit um, what, the, what the cluster is essentially defining, because then it just becomes compliant by default because the policies are already built in. And then lastly, the efficiency model. You want customers to be efficient with their resources. By running on a shared infrastructure, they have the ability to be more efficient as they share those resources across teams. So really, really quick, I just wanna talk about the platform engineer capabilities and the software capabilities. Um, think about your platform engineer capabilities. And when building an SSP, you need to think about essentially how you can do things. And we're going to use the word blueprint quite a, quite a bit. Mikhail's going to go into this. You want to be prescriptive. You want to have essentially something uh, that, that is, is repeatable, right? Think of blueprints as the way of doing that. And then think of add-ons, which Mikhail's going to show you as well, as a way to abstract things. So for instance, I want an add-on of perhaps app mesh for service discovery, or I want an add-on for something like container insights. You, you want to be able to do this very, very simply. And ideally, you want to do it via code in a repeatable manner, right? You want to be able to do this. Doesn't matter what region it is. It doesn't matter necessarily whether it's your QA environment or your prod environment. You want this level of consistency. And ideally, you want to be able to do this across any type of compute infrastructure. It shouldn't necessarily matter if it's EKS or eventually EKSA, or maybe you're running it on outposts. You should have this level of consistency across the board when deploying your blueprints. And then if you think about it from the software engineer capabilities or the dev capabilities, the big thing to remember is, again, it should just work. Think about how you can empower your developers so they don't need to worry about things like AWS credentials. You want to think about how can you abstract everything away so simply deploying and it gives them the prescriptive configuration for things like logs, metrics, and all of these things in this batteries included model. Developers don't need necessarily even know anything about Kubernetes unless they want to customize. And then when that case arises, you give them the power to do so. So, so, so with that said, that's the 
a high level overview of the motivations for building a shared services platform. And I want to pass it over to Mikhail so he can actually show you how we're doing this uh, in reality. So with that said, Mikhail. Well, thank you, Carmen. That was a really great coverage of, uh, of the platform. All right, so when talking about a shared services platform, it is important to take into account that uh, it exists in different dimensions and scopes are some of those dimensions. So obviously we start with a global scope and here we, sh we show that there is an enterprise, it has a lot of business units, organizational units, it has lines of business plus um, dev teams, security, governance and platform teams together. All of them require some sort of a delivery framework with deployment tooling and clear processes to onboard tenants and guardrails in place. And that framework is enabling this soft code delivery to various regions uh, running deployment targets such as dev, staging, and prod, uh, multiplying the, the complexity of this. Um, the downside of not implementing a platform like this is obviously um, the lack of agility because uh, a system that is not smooth is going to produce bottlenecks. So moving down the, the scopes uh, row, so to say, uh, we talk about the region scope and obviously infrastructure security is not going, infrastructure <laughs> provisioning is not going away as well. You still, somebody needs to take care of provisioning your VPC with subnets and different availability zones and uh, have metrics and tracing uh, enabled on the perimeter side, we probably want to expose our APIs. We maybe will be dealing with API gateway with Route 53. Um, there is obviously Elastic Container Registry, and then on the security side, there will be a Certificate Manager and uh, uh, KMS and a lot of other services from the security portfolio as well. Um, however, this infrastructure, while I'm talking about AWS, it doesn't have to be necessarily AWS. And uh, I will talk about a little bit about how to implement the same concepts uh, when applied to different clouds. Uh, the cluster scope, we need to provision our cluster, and hopefully it is uh, and not cluster, but clusters plural uh, across multiple regions, multiple accounts. Um, hopefully it's done with an infrastructure as a code. Uh, we need to choose our uh, operating system, whether it's Amazon Linux or Bottle Rocket or Red Hat Core OS or Ubuntu or a custom. Uh, cluster out of scale on Rust being able to backups as well. Observability is uh, uh, extremely important. Their metrics server container insights is uh, our native AWS product, but it can be obviously our Prometheus and uh, Grafana on, on top of it. Um, and tracing should, shouldn't be also underestimated as well. On the security side, we definitely need network policy support. When talking specifically about AKS, uh, it's not natively built in, so you'll have to go with something like Calico or CNI or one of the alternate CNI uh, providers that are uh, validated on AWS. Uh, runtime security is a very important aspect. Uh, uh, OPA and policies, uh, whether it's OPA or Caverno, it will definitely uh, be needed. So someone needs to define and provision all of that together across multiple dimensions, across multiple accounts and regions and uh, environments. And tenants management, I mean, by tenant, I mean a dev team. Uh, for example, uh, we need to onboard them, we need to isolate their network, provide ingress, egress policies that where network policies come to play again. Uh, compute isolated, I mean, isolation is an important uh, aspect and cost, obviously, uh, as part of it, and storage isolation as well. And now, the tenant scope, and I mentioned before, tenant is a, as an engineering team. And as an engineer, I just want to build, deploy, and support. Uh, at this point, we're not going to be making specific you know, statements on what your source code uh, should look like and, and uh, your CI system. We're not going to be very opinionated about it. Uh, it just suffice to say you can choose from um, like any Git-enabled repository, like GitHub, Bitbucket, CodeCommit. And on the CI side, you can use Tacton, a very popular code pipeline is our native offering as well. Uh, to deploy, we will let developers deploy uh, their code, but uh, we will just let them define and control the areas that we want them to control, such as they want to create a Kubernetes deployment. That's great. They want to create a Helm chart. We will support it with customize or you know, with other options uh, that we want to provide to them. Uh, maybe they want to expose their uh, APIs and we'll let them control their ingress. And uh, they want to have progressive delivery to uh, delivery tooling such as uh, you know deployment uh, control as blue green canary uh, various metrics during decisions analysis etc. And on the support side, uh, if we talk about the AWS specifically is CloudWatch, but there are multiple other options. 
um, distributed tracing and as well as access to the cluster for troubleshooting. Sometimes it's important, uh, can be read only uh, for pre-prod clusters. So when I talk about uh, infrastructure as code, I, I literally mean code. In this example, we will be using CDK, and it's a, a Node.js and TypeScript. Uh, in a more general uh, example, it can be uh, one of our partners, for instance, Pulumi also provides infrastructure as code and a way to express infrastructure in a more elegant way using tools such as IDEs that are a lot more convenient compared to, let's say, you uh, extracting a a template with uh, a cloud formation or Terraform, for example. So it is actual code. We will define our stack. Uh, we will create a VPC inside that and create a cluster and uh, create node groups uh, along with it. You can see there is a, a number of add-ons here listed, uh, like Argo CD, and then there is Calico down. That is the level of convenience that we would like our customers to have when they define those blueprint. Uh, and if they need, for instance, uh, a, an observability a solution on top of it, then Container Insights add-on is uh, something that they can consider, or there is a Prometheus add-on uh, and Grafana as well that can be leveraged uh, for uh, their observability stack. Once the blueprint is defined, I can deploy it in, in, in any accounts, in any regions, uh, reusing the predefined uh, infrastructure that uh, exists in our code is also version controlled. So for instance, I want to deploy a single dev cluster or deploy a few staging clusters to multiple regions, or even create a, a whole code pipeline for my infrastructure as code because it is actually code and it needs to follow the same principles for software development lifecycle, including CI and CD and staged um, roll out uh, to production. Let's uh, talk a little bit about those challenges that uh, Carmel is talking about uh, when it comes to leveraging Kubernetes as a whole. It's uh, The whole ecosystem is just so broad and it's very hard to make uh, choices uh, for the platform infrastructure teams as well as for the developer teams. So I'm going to focus on a couple of things like uh, what uh, operating system you need to run. And we have an option of whether it's a general purpose Linux or a bottle rocket or Windows, and when you choose one versus the other. And uh, technology-wise, we support uh, EC2 or uh, managed node groups or Fargate uh, serverless options. Those options are also available with uh, um, not exactly the same uh, verbatim, but similar options are available to choose from other cloud providers as well. So Bottle Rocket is a, a, an open source operating system that uh, was created by AWS. Uh, it was inspired by um, such projects as uh, Red Hat Core OS, uh, but before Red Hat, it was just Core OS and uh, uh, Project Atomic and some other uh, not equivalents but similar similar operating system in in Spirit. Uh, it ships with certain packages, uh, uses uh, image-based updates. That basically means there is no package manager built in. Uh, you basically have the whole image uh, for, for the operating system, and that enables us to uh, kind of partition uh, the changes uh, that should be applied on top and swap those images if there is a problem, for example. It runs with Linux kernel 5.4, which is great. Now you have a, 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 an opportunity to enable, for example, eBPF support with Calico, on top of it, and that uh, relies on uh, a more recent uh, or more upgraded uh, Linux kernel. Uh, there are a lot of other um, advantages to using uh, an operating system like Bottle Rocket. Uh, it is container optimized OS, uh, and uh, it, it is definitely a lot more secure compared to uh, other options. We will provide reference at the end of this uh, presentation so that you can explore uh, and find more information about this operating system. So it, let's say here is my objective as a, uh, as a platform engineer. I want to provision uh, a bottle rocket uh, cluster. Uh, how would that code look like? And when I'm talking about code, I'm actually referring to an actual open source a repository that encapsulates our ideas and reference architecture for the shared services platform, which will be available to you to, um, to explore or to leverage it for your solutions. So you can use a, effectively a concept called a cluster provider. There is a, a bottle rocket cluster provider. You don't necessarily need to write it, but I, just for the sake of uh, the presentation, I uh, you know, depicted how it would be implemented. It can be any other cluster provider as well. 
Uh, so far, managed mode support is uh, limited to uh, Amazon Linux uh, on various architectures, uh, but uh, with this uh, cluster provider, you will be able to provision nodes running a uh, bottle rocket uh, operating system. Um, and um, that's how the uh, overall uh, code is going to look like. Then you will be adding auto scaling capacity. Uh, everything is uh, going to be elastic uh, in, in the true spirit of, uh, for instance, AWS services, and will scale up and down uh, as you desire. Now, with that, we would like to, let's say, start onboarding our tenants. We have a team abstractions, which encapsulates um, users and roles that they have with respect to the cluster access, integrated fully with uh, Kubernetes RBAC, which is also a very important security aspect. At the end of the day, we do need to create, especially as a shared cluster, we need to create a namespace, set up a network ingress, egress rules, and quotas. Um, and uh, an important part as well is the service accounts and potentially integration with IAM walls. Um, similar approaches exist in GCP and AKS if you would like to access resources outside of your cluster. Other, you know, obviously concerns can also be handled within the same abstraction. Once you have those teams, you can start provisioning them uh, at your discretion, uh, depending on where those teams should run and, and which clusters you would like to enable. So you may choose to enable certain teams like Team Troy in US West, but not in US East, for whatever reasons, uh, maybe based on the line of business or regulatory constraints. Uh, once the teams are defined, we need to start onboarding the applications, the workloads, and that's where we talk about the app of apps pattern, which is enabled with Argo CD. Within Argo CD, I can define .NET, Java, and PHP GitOps repositories uh, in a single bundle and uh, in this form. For example, here's a geolocation API. It is a .NET application. Team Troy is provisioning a, a, a machine learning DJL Java service, and Tim Burnham is a, is a PHP. Of all of those uh, deployment descriptors are effectively uh, CRDs, and uh, once I have them, I can bootstrap in a single uh, in a single shot with Argo CD, create apps, and sync apps. Once they are provisioned, um, since we have the container insights add-on, and that's the one that I'm going to be talking about, uh, you can go to our Cloud CloudWatch uh, Container Insight dashboard, and you can see the whole cluster with all the nodes uh, of that cluster. Um, for example, here the blueprint add-ons they are highlighted. Um, uh, in their respective namespace, metric server, DNS, kubeDNS, Calica, Tifa, and uh, CloudWatch. And uh, here we have .NET and Java Spring Boot, plus uh, other workloads. And you can see that uh, we have some metrics, CPU and memory, uh, and uh, uh, network, uh, network metrics are displayed uh, within that console as well. It's monitoring data. With that, uh, I would like to just um, cover a little bit the references uh, to, for further details because it's an extremely broad topic and there is very little that we can communicate with that very short time frame. Uh, they are, th there is a containers on NDPS architecting software delivery platform that goes into some of the details that we discussed today. Uh, bottle rocket information in uh, the uh, open source project that I mentioned, the CDK EKS blueprint is mentioned here, plus a little bit more information on Argo uh, uh, app of apps pattern or Argo CD in general. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I hope you enjoyed our, our session. Yep, thank you.